Mr. Wicker's Window by Carly Dawson, Chapter 5. Well, no, began Silly. That's a tale that not everybody knows, you don't you see. And Mistress Becca would not be cared to be reminded of it, mark you, for reasons I shall shortly tell. His eyes, humorous as they were, took on a shrewdness under their sandy brows, as if judging the character of the boy before him, and his ability to keep a secret. First and foremost, he said, I had best know who I am. He leaned back and hooked his thumbs under his armpits in a prideful gesture. My lad, said Ned Sinley, thrusting at his chin, I am a member of the Mirabelle's crew. The Mirabelle? Chris exclaimed. Why, that's the ship in the bottle. Aye, agreed Siley, nodding sagely. The model of it's in a bottle right enough, since it's myself that made it. The last trip home from the Cheney Seas. You made it yourself? Chris breathed, looking aghast at the gnarled, knotted fingers, thick and roughened by work and weather, picturing to himself the delicacy of the miniature ship that lay so snugly in its transparent walls. How in the world could you get in inside? he asked. Ned wagged his head. Ah, tis a trick and a tedious thing, no mistaken, but there's time and to spare for it, coming home from China. China? You've been there? What's it like? Chris wanted to know, his eyes eager. Sally smiled at him, a snaggled tooth friendly grin. There's a tale for another time, my boy, for there's much telling there. You into the story of Bucky's fine hat? Yes, yes! Chris urged, before she comes back. Well, no, began Sally. Being a member of the Mirabelle and all means I see quite a bit of this port when we're home. He looked arch, as if Chris must know the reason for that. And seeing as who Master Specky and me are fast friends, well, she's told me a thing or two not that not everyone knows. He took a pull on the mug and wiped the froth from his lips. It seems... He began, that in her younger days, Mr. Specky had one craven. She's seen this heart that she now wears, and a milliner's, and have it she must. No, and the sailor leaned forward as the story held his own interest. No, a heart of that sort costs many a shilling, and Becky worked and saved for that bonnet for over a year. He eyed Chris again closely. If you tell what I tell ye, Chris lad, well, he conjured Jim. I shall get even with you, I swear I will, for I would never want to hurt the feelings of Becky Boozer on my oath. I'll not tell, sir, not to anyone, Chris assured him. Ned Siley seemed satisfied. Well, no, hunching closer to with his chair, it seems at long last she paid for that bonnet and decided to wear it to the spectacle, not very afternoon. The spectacle? Chris questioned, his forehead wrinkled. What's that? Ha! Ha! Crickled Charlie. You are a country boy! What the spectacle! What the players are! The theatre! What else? Oh, Chris said shortly, and thought of television and of the movies, and held his tongue. He was spinning in a try to fit himself into two centuries before his own time. Yes! took up Siley. So I was saying, Mr. Boozer being young and flirty in them days, and rightful proud of the bonnet she had took so long to earn, wore it to the spectacle, together with her best goon. Now, as you seem not acquainted with the theatre, me lad, let me tell you that we gave it here in any hole standard vacant, and out of doors in fair weather, and we see the benches in the rows for those that pay for seats. He pulled out an evil-smelling clay pipe and stuffed it with tobacco, tamping it down with one grubby forefinger, and when it was well lit, pointed the stem at Crest by way of emphasis. Mr. Speckia gets herself a good place on this occasion, and sits herself down, a tossing of her feathers and her flowers, and as proud as a peacock, every inch of her. The people pack the benches, and the performance then begins. Rightly, and silently jabbed the pipe stem at Chris. Rightly, only ladies of quality wear such hats as Becky wore, and should they go to the spectacle, which would be doubtful, for the crowd makes it no place for gentlewomen. They would be sitting off apart, don't you see? But Becky starts sparring in the centre of the hole, and you've seen the hat. Tis big enough for two, and no mistake spreads along as well as up. Well, 
the time came to begin. The players came out on the stage, speaking of their parts and a brandishing of their arms as they do, when all at once a gentleman sitting behind Becky Boozer leaned forward and asked her, ever so polite, Madam, says he, please be so good as to remove your bonnet. Here Siley leaned forward, one hand on the stomach to facilitate a bow, aping as best he could the speech and manners of a gentleman. In a flash, he resumed his own character and turned to Chris. Well, did she take it off? I demanded of Chris, frowning with concentration. Twas off with rare politeness. Anyone would agree to that. He shook his head solemnly. Why, no, Master Christopher, that she did not. Our Becky had just paid the final pence upon that hat, and after a year, seven months, and eighteen days, the hat was hers. She wanted all beholders to admire it. What cared she if the gentleman seated on the bench behind her saw more of her bonnet than of the play? And Becky Bowser's opinion was t'was more, more than fair exchange. So she, she tossed her head to Becky and dared not even a reply. Siley tossed his own sun leech thatch and pushed his up his mouth in imitation of Becky. Then, with another change of, change of grimace, he shunted up his eyes to signify the growing intensity of the situation and, leaning halfway across the table, shoved the plush's pies and goes out of the way with his elbows. His deep voice sank to a hussy whisper. So the performance went on. I'll never a glimpse of it did the poor gentleman see, seated as he was behind our Becky Boozer. So, month and more, she bends forward and he speaks at her ear, urgent-like. Sally's eyebrows rose and fell with his agitation. So strong was the grip of the story upon him that it was evident that he fancied himself at the play and could see the whole thing before him as plain as day. The poor gentleman says again, he took up. Madam, he says, I beg of you, please to be so kind. Nothing of a spectacle can I see. Please be and be so good as to remove your hat. And would you believe it, my lad? No! Ned Siley shook his head from side to side. No, no, you would not. He leaned back, waving his hand, and as if to wipe away any lingering doubt in Chris's mind. Must respect it, Rekka Boozer, or is that proud? That proud that not for all the world would she remove her bonnet. Dear me, no. She tossed her head again, feeling all them plums a tossing too, and sat up straighter than before. And she a tall woman. Master Siley took a red bandana handkerchief from his coattail poppet and mopped his face, so excited and heated had he become at his own telling of the tale. Then once more he leaned forward confidently. Chilly. Well, little did she d- he dream, our Becky Boozer, for when she tossed her head the second time and made no motion to remove her hat, the gentleman bent toward her, and no doubt as once for, for her alone, and this is what she said. Ned Siley's blue eyes popped and he cupped his hand on the side of his mouth so his words could carry no further than the few inches dividing the boy and the man. He said, And so she told me it did sound like a roar of thunder, though no one else did seem aware of it. So then, Rebecca Boozer, wear your hat, the gentleman said. The devil himself should have no power to take it off in you. And do you know, whispered Siley in a low rumble, his eyes starting out of his head as if it were his own. "'Tis our belief it must have been the devil himself who sat behind her there, for that very time Rebecca Boozer has been able to remove that hat neither by pushing, pulling, praying, steaming, cutting, tearing, nor any other method whatsoever. The devil it was! The devil it must have been!' Master Siley, exhausted by his recital, fell back in his chair with just strength enough to left to replenish his pewter mug from the jug of ale. Then, refreshed, he set the mug down, wiped his lips, and cocked an eye at Chris, who was st- uh, staring at him open-mouthed. Try it yourself, he suggested, wagging his head. I have. You'll not be able to heave it off, that I promise you. That hat is there for good and all. Mr. Boozer will doubtlessly be buried in that bonnet. He cocked his head the other way. And what do you think of that? Ned Siley inquired. After a long and thoughtful pause, Chris found his voice. Master Siley, he said respectfully, does she sleep in it? 
The picture of the elephant tie and Becky Boozer with the counterpane under her chin and the hat with 24 red roses and 12 waving black plumes rising above the window took hold of the sailor's fancy. He tipped back in his chair and laughed till he cried, and as he was coughing and spluttering, Mistress Boozer herself came rustling out of the passageway and asked across the table of the kitchen, "'Be off with you, boy!' she cried. "'You and Sally, you're two of a kind, that's plain to be seen!' She looked from one to the other, and Chris decided it was a good thing for him that Becky likened him to the object of her doting. Master Siley, Get along with you, she cried again, pulling Chris up out of his chair by his coat collar. You are wanted by the master in study, so look sharp. It's down the passage and to your right, Becky said. A knock before you go in. Chris started off, but in the dusk of the passage, he looked back in time to see Becky Boozer lost in tittering giggles and wild blushes as Master Siley reached up as high as his arm would go, chuckling under his chin. Mr. Wicker's Window by Carly Dawson, Chapter 5, End.